you very much for coming on a Friday morning, and a very special Friday morning, because obviously today is International Women's Day, although really it should be Women's Day every day of the year. In fact, it's almost been basically a century of extraordinary progress for women. And each year that we have this day, it's not just a looking back on what we've achieved, but also setting an attention of where we go from here in the next year and onwards. Um, my name is Joy Ladico. I am a columnist for the Evening Standard. Uh, I run a club called uh, The Trouble Club, which is a women's talks club, and I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, and I am um, very honoured to have two very special guests here today. Um, we are going to be talking about the issue of FGM. Um, and this is one of those things that has it's been extraordinary to have the interventions on FGM and to see how fast change can happen if you have the right voices, the right people, and the will to do something on the ground. Um, our special guest is uh, Nimco Ali, um, who I'm uh, honoured to call a friend, as well as uh, being able to interview her. Uh, we met, about, I think, about four or five years ago? Yeah. yeah. And uh, we had a very uh, 2015 election night. We had a very long night together, <laughs> and we bonded over that. Um, she is a, a feminist, she's an anti-FGM campaigner, she's an FGM survivor, and she's a self-proclaimed oversharer. Um, on that point, I will just quickly share the fact that her proof copies of her book that's coming out in June called Rude have just arrived, and it's got a fantastic front cover, and you should look it up if you can. Um, Nimco is a former child refugee. She moved here from uh, Somalia at the age of four. Uh, she survived FGM at the age of seven, and she went on to find a voice about it and to co-found an organisation called Daughters of Eve, which is a charity uh, that was uh, dedicated to ending the practice. Um, since then, she has been um, invited to speak at events all around the world. Um, she's been Women of the World, the Girls' Summit, the UN Commission on the Status of Women. She's won uh, so many awards that I can't even actually name them all, but we start off with Cosmopolitan's Women of the Year 2010, BBC's 100 Women, uh, Women of 2013, Red Magazine, and there was a list in the Evening Standard uh, Top 1000 called Changemakers, the people who really made London, uh, last year that Nimco was uh, essentially at the top out with another 10 people. Um, and um, she's trustee as well for uh, Women's Refugee Women and the Emma Humphreys Memorial Prize, and a founding member of uh, the uh, Women's Equality Party, and her new project is called the Five Foundation, and it is uh, getting funding to the front line um, for working with FGM. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on in the conversation. On my left, um, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, the ODI's very own uh, Principal Research Fellow, uh, Nicola Jones. She's the Director of Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence Research Programme, and that is following the lives of 18,000 adolescents in six, six countries in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, her specialism is a, a wide range of policy research projects, and this includes mixed methods studies on child marriage in Ethiopia, uh, gender-based violence in South Asia, and cash transfers to support Palestine, uh, Palestine and Syrian refugees. So what we're going to do is we're going to sit down, we're going to have a, a conversation with uh, Nimco and Nicola, going to be about half an hour, 40 minutes or so, and then we're going to op open up to questions and answers. We have an online audience, hello online audience, uh, and you, if you're online you'll be able to tap questions in on your screen and they will uh, appear on this little um, tablet I've got in front of me, um, and for the audience here I'll come to you absolutely live. And if you are tweeting, um, feel free to tweet under the I, uh, hashtag IWD2019 hashtag, and also please do tag in the ODI. Thank you for being here. Right, Nico. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with you. Just for those who don't know your story, can you tell me um, essentially how you arrive at the point of becoming kind of one of the most prominent FGM campaigners in the world? Um, so I, um, it's, it's always really interesting when I meet um, very privileged white men who always say to me, how did you get involved in FGM? And I, and I say, it's because I had it. And they're like, oh. <laughs> so <laughs> ultimately, um, I, I was subjected to FGM when I was seven, and it was um, one of the most ridiculous things to ever happen to me, and it obviously altered my life in a massive way. Um, the fundamental thing to that was at the age of 11, because I had a really invasive form of FGM, and um, I, had a, I had what is called type three, which is infibulation FGM. So there's three forms, um, three key forms of FGM, and then there's number four, which they just lob everything in together. So number one is, um, a clitoridectomy, so it's removing the, um, either the hood of the clitoris or the, like you know the external part of the clitoris and re reducing the labias. 
Type two is um, like, you know, um, unhooding of the clitoris, cutting it, and then also removing the labias. I'm very relaxed about the way that I say that because the people that carry FGM are not medically trained. So we have very legal um, and medical definitions of what FGM is, but it can vary from type one to type four in terms of what, um, and what happened to women. But for what I had, which the one is very specific, is I had infibulation where your anatomy is stitched together and that's very common within the Somali um, um, communities out there. And that meant that from the age of um, seven until I was 11, it was like, um, it was very hard for me to use urinate and um, when I was 11 I collapsed in primary school and I was taken to a major hospital in the UK so for me it happened to me in Africa but my experiences happened here in the UK and I remember still searching for answers and never really realizing why this thing happened to me my teachers didn't give me answers and my mother and my family had no answers as well um, and for me I think the, the moment that I checked out um, was when I was coming to ter um, coming um, out of surgery, and I, there was this incredibly beautiful nurse who had ginger curly hair, and she looked at me and she just grinned, and I thought, why are you grinning? You must have seen the realities of what FGM was, and you could actually tell me um, something about it. She she didn't say anything to me. I didn't say anything to her, and I re and I decided at the age of eleven, after I came out of the hospital, that I wasn't gonna search for answers anymore, I was just going to get on with my life. And I did get on with my life until 2006, when I went to a local academy in Bristol, where I was there to talk to some young girls about um, going to Bristol University and just like, you know, trying to break the mould of what their families expected for them. And as soon as the teacher left the room, there was 15 Somali girls, so there's 14 of them, are 40, um, 14, between 13 and 14, and there's me in my early 20s. And one of them said, Miss, is FGM halal? And she put it in an Islamic context, and I thought, it's 2006, like, what, what the hell do you guys know about FGM? And I was very flippant and I said, like, how many of you know if someone has had FGM or has ever had FGM? And 13 out of the 14 girls had been subjected to FGM. And in that moment, I understood that my silence was massively complicit into the misunderstanding of FGM. And that a form of violence against women and girls was happening in the country that I loved, that I thought had actually sought to protect girls like me. And I made this conviction that I was gonna um, do something about that. And I started my journey in 2010 to really um, come to the point where we are today, where a future free of FGM is a tangible reality and something that we can ultimately achieve. That was a long rounded way of saying I had FGM and then I got really angry and did something in 2010. Can I, can I ask you about how your family, how you spoke to your family about it? Um, I didn't really speak to my family. So um, I've, I've grown up in the last um, like, you know, 12 to 18 months in, in the sense that I didn't speak to my family. I, um, I knew that my mother knew FGM was wrong, but I just couldn't understand why she wasn't able to articulate it. And I realised there was a lot of anger in, in terms of the fact that, like, you know, why did this thing happen? And a year and a half ago, about, um, I decided that rather than expecting an apology from my mother, it was my place to really apologise to my mother to say that she wasn't, like, you know, I'm sorry that there wasn't anybody um, there to support her and to make the decisions not to cut me. So for me, for a long time, I didn't have a conversation um, with my family because everybody else had been through FGM, so there was nothing to really talk about. Okay. Um, I on your travels, which has been a kind of great journey of learning, um, obviously here in the UK and in various African countries you've visited on top of Somalia, Somaliland. Um, what have you understood about the way the practice is carried out in different countries? You've know, talked a little bit about the variation of type, but the kind of variation of circumstances as well. Yeah, it's like so, so like in, like in in the within the Somali communities, it's it's a so entrenched that nobody really asks why it's being done. It's like it's a, such a norm, and nobody has a conversation, and nobody stands up and says, "I don't want to do this." So it just kind of carries on as a matter of like, well, we we've all been cut, so let's just carry on doing that. There's nobody that ever takes a stand and say, "Actually, we need to." stop doing this and the reality and which has been really interesting is that a lot of people don't want FGM to happen but they don't know other people don't want FGM to happen and then you have um, communities in Sierra Leone for example where it's very much politically motivated and is really entrenched in, um, in, in, in those societies and then you've got places in Kenya where it's like you know that the FGM uptake is dropping but places where it's still happening it's universal so within the Maasai and the Samburu community it's a point of I cut the girl and then I have him married off the next day. So there is like 
subsequent reasons why everybody does it but the but the main but the main um crux of it all is the value of women within these communities like you know women are not valued as actively active citizens they are valued as a commodity in order to um exchange goods between and a cut woman is worth more and a cut woman is more um stable in the sense that you you can control her sexuality you can control um who she gets married to and all these things so ultimately it's about the lack of um, power that women have within these communities is the main thread that runs it. Through. When, when you were at 10 Downing Street yesterday, I was in the audience, and you were <coughs> talking about, um, I think, this obviously isn't general, this is rather specific, but the value of a girl related to cows and yeah. her dowry. Um, it was it Helena, Helena Morrissey yeah. who came up with the example where um, a girl who would be worth six cows in a dowry would then double their value had they been cut. Yeah. That's correct. And we, and we, we have this conversation between the difference between the dowry and the bride price. So we'll say bride price in the sense that, yeah, the value of the girl is that if she's cut, so it's in Tanzania specifically where FGM rates are dropping, but where they're not, like, you know, and the men were very happy and open about the transactional values of the girls and saying, like, if she, if I cut her, then I'm going to get some more cows, and if I don't, then I won't. So. It wasn't the value of the health of the girl, or actually, in order to see his daughter succeed, it was more, it was how many cows he could get, and that was similar in Kenya as well, where if you, um, if like for example, if there's a massive drought and you don't have any more cows, but you have daughters, then you're actively going to sell your daughters, and you have to cut them in that in in order for her to be sold into. Um, the marriage, which is sexual enslavement, anyway. I I hate the fact that we use the word marriage in a non legally binding contracts. Okay, um, Nicola, you've conducted a lot of research into the um, harmful traditional practices. Um, how does this resonate? What have you understood based on your research? And what? Are the, and can you also explain a little bit what the key differences are uh, in FGM across contexts? We were talking earlier about income, and we assume it's always a poor, a poor people's problem, but that's not necessarily the case. Oh, very good questions. Um, I think just first of all to say, I mean, obviously the the pain, the physical and the psychological trauma, but also this issue of you know lack of agency. Um, it all resonates very much with the the stories from girls, their mothers, their grandmothers that we've been undertaking in the the research we're doing, um, and particularly in, in Ethiopia. Um, but I think you know what's really key to point out is the diversity first of all of ages at which the practice happens. So it can be done in infancy. It might be done in middle childhood. Um, I think the average girl um, will be um, subject to the practice before she's five years old. But for some, then it is also happening in mid-adolescence. So right, as you're saying, right before marriage. So huge diversity in terms of age. Um, secondly, huge diversity also in terms of trends. So there's a DFID funded research program on FGM and in the 30 countries where it's taking place, 15 countries we've seen stagnation, very little decline over the last decade. In another 14, we're actually seeing some significant decline. So I think that's critical. Um, and then, as you're saying, there's you know, also variation in terms of drivers. Um, so it can be about sexual purity, about marriageability, but it can also be very much tied up in terms of religious identity, whether that's within Muslim or, or Christian faiths, and also ethnic identity um, in some contexts and, and multi-ethnic societies. So I think that's important. And then another one that I think we don't think enough about is also who's actually carrying out the practice. Is it mothers and female relatives? Is it traditional midwives who need the income? They're often very marginalized in their own communities. Um, or is it health professionals? So in places like Egypt and Sudan, where it's now become a very medicalized practice, it yeah, it can be nurses and doctors. Um, so huge diversity there. OK. So I think we've laid out the territory. Uh, then we need to begin to look at the solution, some of which are arriving, some of which are yet to come. Um, there is no one uh, size fits all solution on this. What are the kind of changes that you have yourself been facilitating, or you've been seeing elsewhere, that are beginning to work to progress things? Yeah, it's, uh, for me, I think the main the main factor is that we have to understand that this is an African led movement. It was the it, it was women on on the, on the African continent that wanted FGM to be defined, and it's women on the African continent who really want it to end. So, um, in in terms of the way that we look at aid and support, I think it's trying to get people to understand that solidarity is more key than actually going over there and telling Africa that FGM is wrong. They know FGM is wrong, but it, they, like, we have to understand the key um, motivating factors around that. So for me, one of the, 
like you know, so getting the um, 36 million out of Diffid in 2013 was a key factor because FGM was always funded through something else, maternal health, or it was funded through young adolescents rather than saying, actually, we need to look at it specifically to prevent FGM. So the, the conversation is, and in, now we have a number, we can say that we can prevent um, close to 70 million girls from being cut between now and 2030. And beforehand, we were just talking about changing the social conversation and really getting people to understand the harms of FGM. But I think now, for me, the, the tangibility is like saving girls. And that's, a, and that's a clear urgency that's changed in the last um, um, few years. And I think it's because I used to campaign as a seven-year-old. I campaigned for my seven-year-old self. And then I campaigned, so now I'm campaigning as an adult to understand that we as survivors and we as um, privileged people, because I do say that I've been through FGM, but I'm immensely privileged, have the ability to create the platforms to really make this change happen. Um, can you give me some, con you've been, been travelling to a number of countries now, can you give me some concrete examples of some of the kind of women you've seen who've been intervening and beginning to kind of change the story on the ground? Yeah, so it's, and, and, and this is what I mean, it's like the key factors in why people cut us so different, and women in the communities, we really understand, so in the Somali community of Kenya, the, the uh, Somali region, FGM is still close to universal, so, and they do infibulation FGM, which is type 3, which is the most severe um, in that case, but there was one ca there was one story where we're talking about actually the the the, tr the traditional midwives were um, both given twenty four um, goats, which in in total cost about um, like you know a thousand dollars, which is about eight hundred pounds, and the, and those women stopped cutting because they found a new revenue and a new income, and then there was space for people to have a conversation to say that like an FGM is wrong and really see young girls who, who haven't been cut and see how different they are. In my own country of Somaliland, where we are, we are trying to get le legislation on the table at the moment, just um, so in fe on, on, fe on, on February the 6th, there were massive posters saying that we need to end FGM. And that was, and people sending me Snapchats of like, you know, like, you know looking at this massive, um, like, you know, billboards, which were badly designed, but at the same time, it still said that we need to stop FGM. And it wasn't that we need to stop infibulation, we need to stop type one or type two. There was no, um, def like, there was no separating the different kinds of FGM. And now I think there's a collective conversation to say that, all FGM is bad because a lot of people will say to you, "Well, if you move from infibulation to type one, then that's success." It's not. It's not a success. I think all, all FGM is wrong, and I think so. For me, those are the kind of things that really work. And there's an incredible woman called um, Josephine who's in Kenya who directly, physically um, takes girls out of those communities, uh, but then starts to rehabilitate, like you know, do the reconciliation ceremonies where they understand that the uncut girl is valued. So there are incredible work happening, and they're happening on. A fraction of the price of the money that we have. Josephine is actually going into a, a family where there is a danger of a girl being cut and actually removing her, taking essentially to a, yeah. a safe house and just changing the, the story of how that, uh, of what happens next. Yeah, which and then but, but it's, it's it's quite a kind of radical solution. It's a radical solution, but the impact on that is actually quite incredible as well. In in, in a sense that we went to go visit one of the um, girls that jo Josephine has rescued and has been with Josephine for seventeen years. That girl unfortunately wasn't saved from FGM. But what happened was that she was cut and then she was sold off into marriage. And um, a, a local village uh, called Josephine said that there's a girl screaming every night, and I think you, you need to come and get her. So she went and got and and got her, and then they ended up. Um, have, so, what, so what she does is the mother and the girl still have a conversation because she's really keen in terms of having these um, ensuring these girls have a connection with their community. Um, that young woman is now 17 and went back for Christmas in order to um, to spend time with her family. And this is where the drought and the incidents about cows comes in. The father, who who was quite wealthy now and had a few cows, had some kind of incident. There was a virus that was going around, and a lot of these cows ended up dying. So he thought oh, I'm going to replenish the stock by selling one of my daughters. And what she did, that older sister being, in, being there, is she called Josephine. So her younger sister, who's now 11, was saved from FGM and early forced marriage. And they're having conversations about the 10 other girls in that family that could be saved. So it has taken seven years, but it's about the real agent of change being, like, you know, that empowered girl who had gone through FGM, now saving her sisters. So you also mentioned earlier on that uh, it was people in Af it was women in African countries who didn't want FGM to happen, 
but they also didn't have the space to speak about it. You just mentioned that billboards are now going up. So how have we got to the point where something is a, a, you know, a, a, a private matter within a community to the point at which it's become a national conversation? I think it's about connecting. It's about, um, w w w within my own country, it's about saying the fact that I can advocate on behalf of these women to say that these women do really want FGM to end and they, and they want our support and they want our solidarity. Those billboards were put up by a charity that I said that that should be doing more on a on a uh, on a national level because I was getting Somali um, it was really interesting so the, so the first time I went back to Somaliland it was 2016 and I hadn't been back since I was seven and it was the city of my birth it's the only place um, outside of Manchester I've been free of FGM and when, when I left my mother was like don't talk about FGM and I was like I'm not going to Africa to talk about my vagina it's not gonna happen um, a year later, I was back talking to the future president, saying the fact that he needs to do something about FGM. And now I go back and I have men that are coming up to me saying, I've got three daughters and I'm not going to cut them. And that's why I said to this charity that you do desanitization work apparently on ending FGM, but you need to put it on a massive level. So it's about using my privileges in order to get the people with um, finances to do things better. Okay. Um, we have also sort of entered the point where you're talking about legislation within Somaliland, potentially, um, and also there's been a lot of legislation here that's now specific uh, to FGM, and today we had the first p person who's been uh, found guilty, uh, a woman who's been found guilty of uh, cutting her daughter. Um, can you t talk to me a little bit about how the legal route also just backs up the kind of cultural change that's going on? And your own part in it as well. Yeah, well, do you know what? The law the law has a mandate in every society is that we all do things because the fact that the law says and those things come from our social responsibilities and our values. So law always represent the values that we have in the country. And when I was growing up, because um, I never wanted to do any work in developing countries because I knew there was other people that had um, more expertise than um, I did in those countries. But I had expertise and the lived experience in the UK where... I told my teacher when I was seven, and she told me that's what happens to girls like you. I was in a major hospital, almost dead, with kidney failure when I was 11, so they saw the scar tissue that were there, did nothing. And I knew that like, there, there had to be a statutory agency, there had to be a statutory duty placed on professionals in order to report and to do something. And if anybody remembers, the coalition government was a very interesting thing, but the um, ministers kept on moving around. And in 2015, we got the Serious Crime Bill, which gave protection orders to girls and put a mandatory duty of reporting on professionals. That was quite a hefty thing to ask, but I wanted something else to change. And adding FGM to, to the Children's Act was key to that. Um, getting education in schools were kind of key to that. So, like, you know... I, a government saying that it cares about young brown girls in this country means a lot, like, you know, it means amazing things because I was always, um, the FGM legislation is, in, is, is great that we made FGM illegal, but it, but it kind of like, you know, blinded people to other duties of care that they had as though if I did, F, if I cut your anatomy now, it'd be GBA, it'd be a lot of things, it'd be child abuse. If my anatomy was cut, it's like, oh, let's have a look at the cultural and, and narratives. And I remember one saying to the Prime Minister when she was at the Home Secretary, I said that my vagina is as British as anybody else. It doesn't need <laughs> it doesn't need a different lens in order for it to be interpreted on. And that's what we've done now with placing FGM in the Children's Act. It means that all children uh, should be protected and protected by horrible things like FGM. Now this is, this is a piece of legislation that I believe is being uh, read again on Monday and should pass the Commons. Uh, and there was an, there's been an intervention by the Prime Minister after a, a backbencher tried to derail it to say, actually this absolutely central um, and can you explain what your intervention on the Children's Act is? It's just to basically say that um, FGM is um, so protection orders can be given um, for children that are at risk of FGM at the moment um, like you know serious harm is one thing but it's really hard to prove that so um, and, and, pre and, pre and preventing FGM is key is key to ending it um, I was just saying that, like you know in um, a few years ago, I think it was like 2013, um, there was a stat that one in 10 births to women in Southwark, which is this borough, was born to women who had FGM. And if those births are girls, then those girls are at risk of FGM and we could have put protection orders onto them. And that's what I mean, this three-year-old who's, um, this mother's convicted of um, carrying out FGM to, if you have children, you know how many statutory agencies are involved in a child's like well-being. And I'm telling you, if somebody's going to be that blatant to carry out FGM here in the UK and also be that blatant enough to lie and say that it was a child falling, 
there were indicators there that this woman was pro-FGM and those protection orders could have been taken out a lot, a lot earlier. So what this legislation will do is hopefully stop um, girls like the one whose mother is going to be sentenced today from yeah. being cut. And that should be, um, and that should literally pass before the end of this month. Yes. Uh, much more chance of passing than the Brexit withdrawal bill <laughs> currently going Definitely. through. Um, <laughs> Nicola, um, now listen, one of the uh, one of the things that Nimco has a lived experience, she has a lot of uh, experience on the ground and talking to uh, governments. You are doing the kind of drilling down of evidence, uh, bringing back kind of facts, arguments, and so forth. What, what does that evidence do when we're trying to kind of push the FGM question forward? I think it's a really important point, and I think particularly today on uh, International Women's Day, then what's critical to think about is sort of the role in, of feminism, right? I mean, feminism is really about reframing issues that were seen as personal and not things to be talked about, talked about in uh, public policy, and really putting a spotlight on them and bringing them into the, the, the policy and political agenda. And so I, I think, you know, that's really where research can be very powerful. So we can take one story, but then multiply that and then understand the variation of girls' stories across multiple contexts. And so that's what we're doing with the Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence Program. Um, so in Ethiopia, for example, we're working over the next eight years uh, with 4,000 girls who are able to capture the complexities of girls from very different religious, socio-cultural, ethnic backgrounds and really figure out what it is that's going to make a difference um, for program interventions in their lives depending on you know, what age they might be subject to the practice and who might be carrying it out. And so I think you know, there's, there's very different types of interventions that different evidence will lead us to. So for example, in places where it's now medicalized, for example, Egypt, um, you know, programming that raises awareness about the health risks of uh, FGM is not going to cut it. Sorry, it's not going to, um, pun unintended, is not going to um, be persuasive or, or resonate with populations. There you're probably going to have to work with health professional regulatory boards, for example. But if you go to, say, you know, rural pastoralist communities in Ethiopia where people are not aware of the, the physical risks, then um, raising awareness around health, um, long-term health consequences can prevent, you know, complications in childbirth, fistula, hemorrhaging at the time, et cetera. So it can be incredibly powerful. Um, and so I think it can really help the government um, in figuring out what strategies are going to be most effective and most cost-effective both in the short term, but also for more sustainable norm change. So those particular communities you can get in to draw evidence from, where can you not draw evidence? Where are the gaps in knowledge? And how do you fill those? So there are many, um, but I think one of the most telling pieces of research I've read recently is again from this DFID funded research program um, that the Population Council is running. And they did a big evidence review of 70 different interventions basically they concluded that the evidence is generally of poor quality and focusing on a very limited range of interventions. So we need to have much better um, evaluation evidence on interventions and it needs to be longitudinal. So I'll just give you one example. We were part of uh, an evaluation team for the Norwegian government um, for a program that UNICEF and UNFPA had been supporting with a local NGO in the south of Ethiopia. And everyone had talked about, you know, this very successful program and changing community awareness and so forth. And basically it was supposed to have been eradicated from this district. But we went back three years later after this first round of evaluation and we found there'd been really significant reversals. So the girls who were being cut at 12 were now being cut at seven or eight because they had less agency. They couldn't resist their parents. They were going to other districts to get the practice done or they were even putting pressure on health extension workers to do it so it would be seen as less risky from a medical standpoint. Um, and so that, I think, was very sobering and really highlights that we can't just take a snapshot. We really need to be investing in evidence that's long term. And, you know, some of the work that we do at ODI is really highlighting exactly how sort of sticky or persistent these sort of entrenched mm -hmm. gender norms can be. So we need to understand that it's not just a um, sort of linear path to change. We need to think about the peaks and troughs and to really capture that through evaluation evidence. And has anybody gone back to this community in southern Ethiopia and tried to work again through it? Is there another attempt to yes. change it? Yes, yes. Um, but really making sure that it's it's not just about... Um, Declarations of we're ending FGM. And I think that's, yes. and I think that is the, and I think that is the thing, is the fact that a lot of these um, um, kind of... 
um, eradication. And this is the thing is like, I hate the word eradicating FGM. FGM is not a virus. It doesn't like, you know, you can't drink it. You can't like, you know, you can't get an antibiotic to it. It's a, it's a deep rooted organized um, crime. It's about unpicking that. So it's about ending something. And a lot of these um, things are led by, um, are led by, white people who think like you know FGM is so horrible I need to support these people and really and um, do something about that and that doesn't work because pe people will tell you what they what, what, what they want you to hear as as long as you're there and there's a really great example about the fact that in Kenya where there's been less international development spending money on FGM things are dropping because there's real agency within the government and within community-led conversations someone like um, Senegal where there's this like amazing organization apparently I won't name check them and then you look at the data and there's only been a 2% drop in like 20 years. And we've spent millions. And this organization in that in, in Senegal has 80% of all UNICEF funding and UNFPA money goes directly to them. And they would say to you, 7,000 communities abandoned FGM impacting. I was like, but how many girls have been cut? And every single girl has still been cut. So I think, so the thing is that you have to get the agency for girls and for me it's like we've made the emotional case for a long time so it's about making the financial case and my african people listen to the financial case of the fact that actually if you don't cut your daughter then she'll be more valuable as an active citizen and if and if african leaders start to protect um, girls as assets to the country then fgm can end okay so let's uh, we uh, i've sort of put this down in my head as kind of the three e's we've got end fgm and it's how do we develop from that? Then we go from education and we also go to entrepreneurship. So when we talk about ending FGM, we end up talking about stopping a form of violence yeah. against young girls, which is both physical, emotional, psychological. What can you do then with that girl? What is the what are the kind of what's the trajectory you can take her on? So you so so you change that value, and I think that uh, investment in the twelve years of quality education is a key thing. And I think like FGM needs money, like you know, spent on it, but it doesn't need billions or millions and millions of pounds. Money needs to go into places like education. Education is the key thing where you change the life expense, like you know, the life experience of girls, and then have access to um, money where where women can invest. So we've got seven, we've got close to seventy million girls at risk of FGM, but we've also got two hundred million women living with FGM, and within that, I think I can have, I can have a few million in that are adolescent girls. It's like these girls have already been cut. How do we invest in their future? And it's about creating careers and creating um, different avenues of investment for them. I'm not, like, you know, as, as we had that event at number 10 yesterday, I'm here to make the case for an uncut girl being more valuable to the world, but it's about the investment has to come from other places, and that's why it's incredible to be here today to say that as we look at young adolescent girls who've probably been failed and have been subjected to FGM, um, how do we make their future better? It's like, better access to healthcare, better access to contraception and access to money so they can start businesses and really benefit the, um, the economy and the continent as a whole. And presumably ending FGM is also changing in a cultural status the value of a girl, yeah. that she is no longer, um, as you say, a commodity but somebody who can be subjected to a practice against her yeah. will. And she's no longer disposable but an actually something you invest in so she becomes um, a good ISA essentially in the sense that you, you do the same. Um, I was at this panel um, at this weekend away about the 12 years of quality education um, and it was the fact that we, we all have diplomatic offices around the world and it's like how do we um, promote girls education and because that's what the UK and the, um, and the developed countries have done is that they've actually valued girls and they started to put them out into the workforce and understood that I know there's a lot of challenges to overcome so we had a, so I was speaking at the tail end of this um, weekend and nobody said feminism and nobody said gender everybody just assumed that girls were out of school because of poverty I said no all children are out of school out of poverty but girls there, there's a choice to be made when you don't educate girls and I think that is the thing that we need to change. So if you're cutting your girls, then you're not going to invest in their education, you're not going to invest in their healthcare, and you're definitely not going to invest money in them in order to start their own business. So Because you're assuming you're going, they're going to be married off yeah. at a young age, and therefore that's their outcome. Exactly. Yeah. So change the track onto the other one. Exactly. So I can. So the global average age of FGM is five, and for me it's about bringing the world, um, seven, so by 2030, bringing 70 million girls who are between five and over who haven't been cut, and then asking you all to invest in them in a different way. Can you tell me a little bit about the Five Foundation, which I think is launching probably in the next few months or yeah. so, but it's been a kind of long dreamed of project to... Um, about how to fund, uh, from basically from everything you've learned, how to really effectively fund um, 
uh, at the end of FGM. So basically in 2013 when DFID invested the 36 million to end FGM, the, the biggest component of that was um, the money was given di directly to the UN joint programme because they, they were the only ones with existing programmes. But ultimately, only 2% of any money intended on gender-specific, like ending violence against women and girls, apparently religious women on the ground. And I think it's like, if we invest in women and we invest in women that are um, doing this work, then that'll be great. And outside of the um, the direct investment to UNICEF, um, to, to, to the UN joint program, there was a six million c communication program, which was meant to amplify the real storage of these women that are doing the great work. And then attract like, you know, major donors that, that did not take off, but what we did is that we collected, and we do on a day-to-day -day basis, is we collect real evidence of what works and we put them into glossy reports. And we sit there and then we create funding streams for ourselves to keep talking about how incredible those innov um, innovations are. For me, the, f the, 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 um, the five foundation is, is the global average age of FGM is five, 5.3 in the Sustainable Development Goals is ending FGM. Okay, five is my new magic number. It's like, how do we um, get money to women di directly? And I'm gonna keep making that case, but as we make that case, I'm also gonna fundraise in order for us to actually give some money to these women. So if you give 100,000, 300,000 to, to these women and you see it working, then we can really amplify that. And tangible change of girls not being cut. You've already got, you've already identified a couple of women in various countries, yeah. and I presume there's kind of war behind them. Can you still tell me about the sort of women who might be receiving direct funding as yeah. a result of the Five Foundation? So, so, so for example, in Kenya, it would be someone like Josephine who has this center where she doesn't have a bus to go pick up the girls. It's about picking up those girls and actually make, make, making their life better. In um, in the Gambia, for, for example, we, um, so when I was working with um, on the different funding programs, we funded this young woman called Jahad we, we, we gave her £20,000 to put, um, and it's so difficult to get that £20,000, and this is the problem is, in order to give a woman on the front line £20,000, it probably costs about £150,000 of like, you know, filling in aid budgets and like, you know, all these other kind of conversations. Jaha put together the first youth conference that was happening in the Gambia. People opened up, people had conversations, ministers were on the um, platform saying, I had FGM and it's bad. And then as a result of that, um, um, Yaya um, Ja, uh, anyway, the former crazy dictator of um, Gambia, um, ended up um, banning FGM. And uh, uh, um, but he's been deposed, and um, Gambia is about to write its new constitution. And something like the Five Foundation would fund the legal, um, the, the female um, association of lawyers in the Gambia, who want to ensure that that legislation st stays on, because those people that are pro FGM are saying this was a dictator's law, it wasn't the people's law, and we need to get rid of it. What we would do is give those women money to either help introduce a new bill or fight the um, campaign in order to keep that bill in place. So it's 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 direct work of strengthening um, organisations that are already existing. Okay. So actual practitioners and then the kind of legal frame and civic So everything, so sure. every country that whatever it needs is about finding those um, real rough diamonds and um, helping them to be scaled up. Okay. Big picture, 2030. What's going to have happened by 2030? We've got the UN Sustainable uh, Goal which commits us to uh, eliminating the practice. Are we going to get there? Yes, I, I'm, I'm really, really hopeful that if um, on the eve of International Women's Day, um, the one of the most generous countries in, in the world in terms of its development aid, the, um, the, um, the UK government had a conversation about ending FGM. And we know that it's it's like, you know, it's said as 86 um, million women, but I think it's about um, 70 million girls that we can save. So we have a, the ability to tangibly save that and uh, like you know you guys do data and you guys do research I would love to see um, how many of those girls are distributed between every country and get Africans to say you've got 10 million to save in Sudan we've got 15 million to save in Nigeria so yeah I think it, it can be done. Nicola what uh, what do you think needs to happen to achieve this goal? Um, it's great to hear Nimkov um, having such a positive take on it. I mean, I, I think there is a lot of energy, but I think uh, the numbers are, are quite sobering, particularly in the countries where we have seen stagnation and even reversals. Um, so I would definitely say, you know, what you're emphasizing about investments in girls' education and um, 
uh, supporting uh, girl and, and women role models is critical. We also have to invest in figuring out how to better change the conversation with religious and faith leaders. Um, I mean, I think there have been some good practices in Ethiopia, for example, we've seen the coalition of NGOs, including the, the Ethiopian Feminist Lawyers Association <laughs> under Egeldam, um, work together with the Orthodox Church, with the um, Protestant Church to start uh, changing the curricula um, in seminary colleges. So, you know, that can then reach um, priests at the grassroots level. Um, I think we are seeing much slower progress with the Islamic Council. Um, and so that's something that we need to think in, in, in the Ethiopian context, that is, we need to think much more carefully about how we can really work together so that faith leaders can become champions of, of change. And I, I think there is not good evidence on how we do that yet. It's really interesting. Um, so Jaha wants to put together a, um, a summit. Um, so I came, back, I, came, I came back from the Gambia about, well, I thought it was two weeks ago, but apparently it's like four weeks ago. Um, I came back four weeks ago and she wants to put this summit on um, in Senegal with all the faith leaders and the Egyptian prime minister um, president has taken on in order for like Egypt is the um, of keeper of um, religious edicts and stuff. And she just can't find the money. She just needs two hundred fifty thousand pounds in order to put on this um, where she where, where she has key commitments. So I think religious leaders are interested, but I think who convenes them and how they're convened. I think the potential is there, um, and if they and they and, but I always say like you know I want them to end FGM. I want them to end FGM within the context of actually really understanding that women have real rights and real responsibilities, and we have duties to care to them. So yeah, so I agree with you in terms of getting the religious leaders on side. But it's again. There are, there are some some of the Islamic religious leaders who've said FGM is not actually an Islamic practice; yeah. it's a cultural practice. And have already come out that way, but presumably there are more that need to move to that position. Yeah, and there's more, and and, and there's more that um, kind of um, keep FGM as a like they're not going to denounce FGM because it's a political um, power. So they have a lot of power in in, in terms of. Um, like you know, we're waving things off. For example, in Somaliland right now, it was the whole point of like, like the legislation can only go, go through if it says all forms of FGM are illegal. I don't like this whole conversation about Sunnah and like really breaking down definitions of FGM is not helpful. And and we as um, as international organisations have to be very specific about the fact that like you know an end to FGM means no FGM as opposed to the types of FGM. I think just another key point I would mention is that what the survey data does show us is that actually in a number of countries there's more support for change among men than among women. And so I think we need to harness that as well. Um, the, the how, how would you go about doing that? Um, well, having men and young boys speak out, as we have seen in some communities, saying that they are willing to um, you know, have uncut... Um, partners and talking out publicly about that there are there are some interesting cases where where that is starting to happen I think we really need to harness that um, it's quite different from child marriage where you know husbands and uncles are the ones who are um, really driving decisions I think women grandmothers aunts are key players and so we need to um, you know be ensuring that the wider community is helping to, to change that um, and then the final uh, sort of plea I would have if we really want to make change by 2030 is that we need to invest in programs that are long term. Um, we can't just have these short term two or three year investments. Uh, norm change, you know, changing discriminatory norms that are so entrenched needs a long term investment. We need to be able to weather the peaks and troughs. And then we need the evaluation evidence that's longitudinal that helps us tell those stories of change over time. I mean, right now there's huge amounts of money that's invested in these demographic and health surveys every two to four years, but they're just a snapshot. Mm -hmm. We just see it at one point in time. They're not really helping us understand what's changing and why. And so we then, you know, really also need to harness the power of. Uh, of qualitative and, and mixed methods research as well. Okay, Nimke, what's, um, what's your message to us, to, to this, this community in this room and online, about those who want to make a real uh, difference to uh, end FGM? Yeah. International Women's Day, come on. I think, okay, oh, okay. Cool. Um, we, all, we all have a massive role to play in ending FGM, but I think it's about like, you know, standing in solidarity and standing with um, women on the African continent, and I can't say that more that this is an African-led movement and we can support them. I don't think we should be substituting their um, voices or also um, hijacking the work. And I think collaborative working is what I'm really passionate about. And like, so, so, so one of the key things about the Five Foundation is, is about bringing people together. Data is key. I love the Democratic Health Service, but when you go to like Somaliland, for example, we have been saying that FGM is at 98% for a long time. It's not probably, it was interesting that the president said to me, 
I don't really agree with that number. It's probably about um, 78%. And I'm like, that's quite specific, Mr. President. <laughs> but it could be, but we don't know. So the whole point is we, we're always constantly um, fighting for a positive na narrative without actual data to back it. And there's nothing better than saying 30% um, of your um, pop -up, um, population has ended FGM, which we can actually, if we manipulate the data, I'm not sure if this is... Um, so we, um, like, you know, count FGM from 14 plus at the moment. So all the women, the 200 million women living with FGM are 14 plus. If the average age is five, I don't see why there's no point in starting at 10. And in places like Somaliland, then you can actually get a drop and say you can probably drop into the 70s from the 90s. And that's quite exciting for them. They think that they've got 70% uptake of FGM and then the next generation can um, keep dropping. So I'm really um, happy to hear the fact that better data that's collected quite regularly is something that you're um, keen on. Okay, um, I'm now going to go to the audience um, uh, and I'm happy to take uh, questions from any of you for, for either Nicola or Nimco. Who would like to start? Don't be shy. In the front row, please. Would you mind um, just telling us who you are, uh, what your organisation is, and just keep the questions sort of nice and focused and direct. <laughs> okay, I'm Ness. Um, I'm a public health professional. Um, FJ Mac campaign as well. <clears throat> so my question is, 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 I mean, maybe to Nimco, yes. Um, recently, I was watching an interview of Fatima Jabe, yeah. the first lady of a country, that is saying she can speak against FGM for X, Y, Z reasons. What? What will be your contribution to that kind of conversation? Because we're trying to put the women in front because it's a, like a feminine kind of issue. And then um, if someone to that level, a first lady of a country, like the number one lady in the country is saying, I'm not speaking against it because of whatever reasons, because she was caught and she's fine, everything went well, you know. So what kind of, how do you have that conversation with those kind of individuals? And I've also, in my course of um, <coughs> health promotion, I've met like medical doctors well-educated people are like, this is our culture and we're not going to change it, you know? So it's kind of, you always meet a, a brick wall somewhere along the line. So I would like to know what narratives you use in those local communities, because here in the UK, I mean, they set policies and laws and they abide by it. I'm a Nigerian and they said, they've eradicated the FGM, but it still happens. Mm -hmm. So how do you, I, mean, I would like to learn from you as an expert, how do you get into that circle and then you know, just, pushing towards a behavior change of a community because, like I said, these numbers, are, they're coming down like baby steps, yes, but then it's not as much as we should. And like you said, I'm sure the funding as well, like you said, when you were talking about UNICEF funding and all that, I was like nodding because all the money goes into the government, but it doesn't really reach the real people that are working on the grassroots communities, you know, so there are really a lot of things to do about, I mean, I'm not talking so much now. That's right. No, no, you, have, you make a valid point, sir. So <laughs> I think I think <laughs> yeah I think one of the things the the um the reason why um data is important is that the fact that Africa's population is growing and so you've got somewhere like Nigeria by 2050 I think it's like half a billion is the actual population and then whoever is at risk of FGM includes so in terms of the fir the um the first lady of Sierra Leone and um, what she said is very problematic and one of the key things is that you have to balance like you know a survivor and also our responsibility and the, and the roles that we have so you might be a survivor of F FGM but as a political leader, you also enter a realm where we need to hold you accountable. And I think as a member um, of the Commonwealth, the, the UK government has a massive role to play to say that we are leading this conversation in ending FGM, and we um, do not take kindly that one of our Commonwealth members is undermining that. So we need to take, like, like you know, the UK government has a role in this. We all have a role in this. Um, key funders and institutions so um, have a role in this. The Sierra Leonean pr um, president is out there seeking funding in investment in this country, we, we shouldn't be investing in somewhere where the, his first lady, who is also as responsible as he is, is on a platform saying that she can't talk about FGM. So if, if you don't know that within, um, within Sierra Leone, FGM is so entwined with the political and social nature of everything. So when there's an election, people are actually buying girls to be cut in order for them to get votes. So it's it's massive in terms of the Bundu society. And um, the First Lady has this new campaign called Hands Off Our Girls, which um, is about sexual violence, and she refuses to put FGM into that. 
But my thing is that if you cut girls, you can't value them. That's why they're raped, and that's where all these other kind of things happen. So I would. So for me, it's about challenging them and holding these people accountable because FGM is a choice, and it's not through ignorance. And if they're in positions of power, report them. I think that's the key thing I would say. If they're in position of power, report them. If you're if you're working on a grass community level, it's a it's painful, but you have to have that conversation and you have to allow that person to be ready, but um, also protect the girls. It's not about you changing your mind for this girl to be saved. This girl is a citizen. She is going to be saved by FGM. Let's talk about your realities in terms of why you support FGM. Um, now we've got a couple of questions coming in online. If you are on the online audience, feel free to plug them into your uh, interface, and they will come through eventually onto this. Um, in relation to Commonwealth countries, which you just mentioned, one question, which is, how do you work towards um, uh, the cultural causes of FGM while working to avoid a colonial colonialist approach? Um, yeah, one of the key things I used to say to ministers is never pick up a baby. That's sort of always the way um, that started that whole um, that that comic relief thing. It's about actually no, it's about understanding. There's so we have to understand our power and our responsibility is that there's actually nothing wrong with you going to Africa and saying like you know FGM is wrong and I'm horrified because you would like so then what you're doing is that in a community where it's a hundred percent that you're bringing a new narrative and a new conversation and then you find people that can really lead the conversation um, 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 lead this and it was um like um, like i said fgm is like you know is an african-led movement that is ending it and we need to stand in solidarity with that but there is nothing wrong with us donating um funding and also supporting to strengthen the um, campaigns where we can which like you know the great stuff that you guys are doing in terms of research and so on how do you feel about that question it's quite loaded Yes, it's, it's a very tricky one, but I, I very much agree that it needs to be um, led by African, increasingly Middle Eastern and Asian women, given, you know, I think even five years ago, we weren't talking about the fact that also girls in Asia or yeah. Iraq or Yemen were at risk. Um, so that's critical to, to broaden that. Um, but I, I think it is very much about playing more of a um, supporting role behind the scenes. So I think, you know, data is key, so we can learn um, about trends over time, but also then I think providing support as programs are set up so that we can actually um, invest in robust evaluations. I mean, that's the thing, there's a lot going on, but we really don't have a good evaluation science around this yet. So I think it's that kind of technical mm -hmm. support behind the scenes where, um, you know, we can all contribute. Um, if you've got another question through, just if you could indicate to whoever's got the microphone. Um, in, the, in the meanwhile, uh, quite a specific one from uh, online about tomorrow. It, uh, it's Nigeria's governorship elections, and only 6% of the candidates are female. Some northern states have no female candidates at all. Uh, these states are also the ones with very high uh, FGM numbers. How can you increase uh, female engagement in politics in African countries, uh, like FGM, where FGM persists, like Nigeria, where FGM persists? Mm. So again, it's like the, it's like we just have to show um, how the West has developed when it's actually included. So it's what's the hashtag for this year's thing? Is better, be, better for no balance for better, balance for better. Yeah. So so the whole point is like balance for better, and it's about making the case for equality that um, equality is as good for men as it is for women, and. Um, like yeah, the West has improved and has actually like you know um, got more 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 prosperous the more women that they've got into um, power, and I do say that there's this quote that I um, love and I for me it sums up why FGM happens and why women are oppressed so much. It says, "Solemn, do you see the potential of a man in a boy, but you always fear the woman in the girl." And women are, because we fear strong women, then we break girls so young. And for me, it's about creating a case to say that actually empowered women are are the core to a sustainable, uh, you know, sustained and progressed country. And men don't need to fear strong women. And how do we actually globally create that narrative is what we need to do. Because the reality is the reason why, why FGM happens, why girls are not educated, is that men feel threatened that if women are empowered, they'll take their seats. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, ditto to all of that. But in addition, I think when we're talking about the 12 years of quality education, yeah. we need to interrogate what that means. I think in many contexts, the education system is... Um, 
very non-democratic, um, the student has a very passive role. And so if we're really wanting to promote um, young women in, into politics, then it's also providing them with the critical thinking skills and negotiation skills that may not be provided within formal schooling systems now. It may be in out-of-school clubs. It may be through school parliaments. I think there's a lot of investment in what it means to actually, as you're saying, be an act of citizenship. And there's um, some good evidence that we have on you know, why investing in, in girls' clubs that teach these kinds of skills um, makes sense that colleagues here can talk more about. Okay, another question has come in from online, um, which is how do we measure social norm change in relation to FGM? I think this is a question for the um, head researcher. It's uh, a tricky one and we're grappling with that. So uh, there's a platform here at ODI called Align that's looking at exactly that question. I think um, one of the things that people are arguing is that we can't just look at attitudes. We also have to understand what are the, the gatekeepers um, uh, in each community. So whether it's religious <coughs> leaders, traditional leaders, medical professionals. Um, so we need to capture their change in attitudes as, as part of that. We also need to understand the reference group. So who are people thinking um, are going to sanction them if they don't get their daughters cut? Um, and capture all of that. How would you go about capturing it? I know it's a very specific question, but are you essentially doing surveys? Are you just observing? We're doing surveys, but then we're complementing it with community discussions. So we uh, are doing something that we call a social norms mapping exercise. So we bring together, first of all, community leaders and try and understand historically what the practice looked like and how it's evolved over time and why. But then we also mirror that and then do it with, um, with mothers, with fathers, but also them with adolescents so we can understand those different perspectives. So it's very much about the, the rich qualitative evidence that I was talking about okay. before. Um, going back to, we were just talked about silence and then the billboards. This is being talked about on media channels, radio yeah. and so forth. So it is now a kind of much broader conversation within a, a media landscape. It is, and it's, but then it's the thing of how, um, um, how we do that. Um, yesterday, um, Ragi Omar asked, like, you know, what can, so what more can the media do and what have we done wrong? And one of the key things is that we've sensationalised FGM. Yeah, it's graphic, it's horrible, it's barbaric, but you don't need to show that. And also, you, in order to understand, there's 137,000 women who've had FGM in the UK. There's one in this room, there's me, I'm sitting here. You you know somebody that has had FGM. And I think the, con the way we talk about um, the issue needs to be more sensitive. And I think... On the, like having learned from my own family and also having conversations about why people are pro-FGM. I think sometimes the personal um, connection is key. And uh, Africa as a continent um, has never been given the privilege of like, you know, un understanding that, that emotional um, well-being of its women. We just assume that African women can bear this stuff and kind of get, get on with it. And why a lot of people... Um, so this, this might sound crazy, but this woman that's going to um, prison today to, for cutting her daughter, I hope she gets help as well. Because in order for you to... Um, recommit a crime that was committed <coughs> upon you means that there's a lot of internal work in that that you have to do so for me i think the attitude changes have to come with some mental health care because that's the key thing why a lot of people either do it through anger or do it through fear and then that's kind of confused with love and protection which i always find quite bizarre okay have we got any more questions from within the room Everybody's very quiet on friday morning there we are hello <laughs> Thank you. Um, Do introduce yourself, please. Hi, so I'm Katie Chadwick, um, and I work independently. Um, I, one of the things that I'm really interested in, one of the big messages from this conversation, I think, is about the solidarity with African women's movements and getting that money to the front line and uh, funding those grassroots movements. But Nimco, you were also talking about how difficult it is to do that and sort of, you know, getting £20,000 to one woman might take, I don't know, X amount of hundreds of thousands to actually get it there. So what do we need to do to change how those funding flows? And what, what kind of advocacy needs to happen within the UK that we are more directly channeling that money to where it needs to go? I think, so the reality is about trusting women and um, trusting African women specifically. So we were talking about yesterday about um, one of the um, events at number 10 was about um, female, was it female, female funded or female founded organizations? 
Uh, so female entrepreneurs, so women, uh, yes. so, so basically, so, 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 um, Sorry so to so make you feel left out about this Downing Street event. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't actually as much fun as this. Yeah, <laughs> um, so they were talking about um, how um, women funded organisations only get one, yeah. one P from, from every pound that men get, so they get like a penny for every pound that I invested in men. Yeah, so if you have a company that is founded by women, one, uh, in terms of investment, um, 1% of all money goes that way, and in fact that number is declining. It's actually quite a shocking <laughs> statistic. You can then replicate that figure when you're looking at aid projects. Yeah. Uh, and so basically the whole thing is that a lot of people don't trust women with money, and a lot of these organisations are led by women, and they're led by black women, and they're led by black women who are African who've also had trauma. So the key thing that we, that we have to do is we have to change how we like perceive women and how we trust women, and also how we measure impact. If, if impact is me giving you a glossy report at the end of the... Um, at the end of the five-year project, that probably is not going to happen. But if, if it's going to give you um, 20 girls that are saved from FGM and a real impact in that community, then that is real change. We have, um, like, you know, 13 billion is our 0.7% um, commitment that we spend every year. And we're so scared. Hopefully with the new editorial change at the Daily Mail, we're so, like, differed funds in a way that it fears being on the front of the Daily Mail, saying you would give money to these black people, or what are you doing? There's grandmothers dying in London. It's, that is not the case. Aid, aid works, and, and, like, you know, and, and, and we should be proud of the fact that we're a country that wants to invest in other countries, but also we need to understand that our resistance in trusting women is, is, is meaning that we're not being as progressive as, um, as we can. So each and every one of us as, as taxpayers is about having that conversation saying, actually, I do trust women on the front line, I do trust African women, and I want you to get that money to them. And if you guys start saying that, honestly, it will happen. I started banging on about FGM, and everybody was like, nobody's going to care about FGM. And it was in every single ma manifesto in the 2015 um, election. So if we start saying that we care how aid is spent and we want it to be given to women, it can probably happen in the next, I don't know when the next election is, probably next week. Um, <laughs> it can be in everybody's ma ma manifesto um, next week. So I think yeah, it is about having real conversations and using our power as citizens to stand in solidarity with these women as well. Um, we've got another question from online. Again, if you're in the room and would like to ask a question, could you just indicate to whoever's got the microphone now? Um, the, the question is about um, uh, Liberia, uh, in particular, in which there are traditional schools where girls are taken to go through practices, including FGM, and those are supported by leading female role models. There's precious little being done to address this. Now, you've already kind of found ways of intervening at a very high level in various <coughs> countries. How do you then crack a problem like Liberia? But do you know what's really interesting about li li Liberia? Is the the president, um, to have the first um, African um, president, she did not say anything about FGM for a long time. And she was very specific about not talking about FGM and not talking about, I remember there was a time when Tony Blair went over there and she and, it, and they started to talk about gay rights. And she said, well, you keep that in your country. I'm not going to talk about it. And I was really shocked. I'm like, but you're the first female president of the Ellen, continent. Ellen yeah. But you know what? Behind closed doors, she was doing a lot of work, and on her final day um, as, as, as president, she, she passed the legislation against FGM. And the data of, of the 10 years of her at the table and 10 years of like, you know, women at leadership, FGM had dropped by 40% without her actually actively saying anything because there are, there, there are subtle things that are happening, and we have to have those conversations. And I think that data. Yeah, that data is out there. So it's about. Um, I think Liberia is quite successful, and it could go back if we do If we keep like seeing the negativity, is about showing the positivity and really shouting about that because there are entrenched things where women are made the head, um, the head of these organisations. But really, the institutions are run through the societies which are led by men. Yeah, I mean, I think with the, the Bush schools in Liberia, um, one of the critical things is making sure that um, these practices are not driven underground. Um, even when we were doing research a couple of years ago in Liberia, because people are aware um, that there's pressures now to, to ban them, then it was much harder to even start conversations. So I think what we need to be thinking about is how can the important role that those schools played as marking an important right to passage in the life cycle be replaced with um, uh, community practices and dialogues which are much more positive and empowering of young girls rather than eliminating them per se. If you drive these practices underground, then over time it's going to be much harder to, to challenge. Okay. <coughs> Question over here. 
Uh, hello, um, I'm Janet Chapman from Tanzania Development Trust. Uh, we're supporting uh, local activists um, in Tanzania. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about so, uh, how effective alternative rites of passage can be and a, a bit about the data in Tanzania more generally. Um, I can't speak to Tanzania specifically, but I can point you in the right direction of, of some of the evidence. But in terms of the rites of passage in the study that I mentioned, the rigorous evidence review that the Population Council has done and this FGM program, of the seven studies that they um, identified as being the most robust, I believe four or five of those were related to rites of passage and were seen as positive. I would only flag that then people who are investing in more longitudinal research like Henrietta Moore at UCL, when she's gone back to some of those communities, she has seen signs of reversals. So I think we need to be a little bit cautious. Um, and when we're thinking about rigorous reviews and what we count as robust evidence to also look at the time frame under which they were, they were undertaken. But I think there's definitely promising um, evidence around it. And I'm happy to follow up offline with more specifics around that if that's useful. Okay. Um, is there anybody else in this room? There we go. Hi, um, my name is Justin. I work with Geopol. Uh, we use mobile phones to survey people in developing countries. Uh, we've talked a lot about hearing from women, raising women's voices, but uh, on a topic which is often highly stigmatized. Uh, one thing that we found is that sometimes doing remote surveys things via mobile. Um, it's easier to for people to speak up because they don't have to worry about the pressure of being seen to have face-to-face -face discussions about such sensitive topics. Um, I wondered if this was uh, sort of work that you guys have also done. I appreciate there's a lot of need for the face-to-face, -face, but also trying to use innovative ways to do research um, and to reach people in that way. Yeah, it's a very interesting emerging field. I know UN agencies are also starting to, I think particularly in Mozambique, doing that on quite a big scale. I think in terms of capturing real-time change in attitudes, it can be really helpful at quite a big scale. Um, I think what's challenging is that you can't then dig deeper in those discussions. So you get an answer, but then you're not able to have a follow-up, and that, that's the disadvantage of not having a face-to-face. -face. So what we have been doing is using tablet-based surveys that the adolescent leads. They're either, they, you know, if they can read it, they, they read it. If not, it's voice-led. Um, and then as they're going through the survey, if there's an interesting or surprising answer, then you can have a, a follow-on conversation. Um, so we, that's called the quick tap surveys. So that's also sort of a combination of what you're talking about. So I, I think it can definitely contribute to the mix of evidence. Okay. Yesterday we talked about uh, um, a company who was, uh, who's essentially text receiving, and this is not a huge survey, but literally giving advice from London to girls in was it Sierra Leone? Yeah, 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 it was. All, yeah, it was a WhatsApp group in terms of the fact that, like, you know, it's powerful. The fact that everybody's online and and um, like Africa is very much online. Um, it's a fact that so you can create WhatsApp groups in order to kind of to dispel myths or to support. And there's women here in the UK that are because they've got the connections with um, with Africa can kind of do that. Um, Josephine. Who who is in Kenya, also on every um, every Zero Tolerance Day, there's a web chat, um, um, a WhatsApp group chat where people can ask questions and they can say things. So it's a bit like the, uh, that, that, that film Purge where you're allowed to be ignorant for one day and say the things that you really think about FGM so she can kind of really educate you about it. So there are innovative ways of using technology in order to get information out there. And I think it's also the same with um, with like you know, just telling young girls that something is illegal or it's okay to feel. I I can I, I think that's the thing. That's that's what I like about data is that if you, um, like Eritrea for example, if you can tell like you know the eighty um eighty three percent of women in women and men in your community think FGM is wrong, that is powerful when you can't be able to talk to each other about it. Okay, uh, we're just going to go back to Liberia very quickly. We just had a query in with some specific information from. Uh, uh, one of our viewers, which is that Ellen Sirleaf, uh, Johnson Sirleaf had to pass an executive order in order to um, uh, get her FGM, um, um, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, her, uh, 
to get the kind of anti-FGM yeah. legislation through. That's actually expired literally started. in the last month. So what happens now? How, so, how do you get that back on the statute? So books? we have to put the pressure on, and I think that's the thing, is not allowing the issues of FGM to slip, because the, and also it shows how hard it is to be a female leader in order the fact that you want to be able to pro progress the country and you can't be all about female issues. But but the female issues or the, or the issues that are affecting women in Liberia, domestic violence, FGM, um, early forced marriage, um, like, you know, um, access to HIV and AIDS um, treatment were key things that, like, you know, all all became better because of the fact that she was doing that underground work. I think it's about, I think a librarian needs to celebrate that it passed the legislation and really, um, like, you know, support the fact that it was the first country to have an um, African leader. I think, the, I think the new president is a former football player, so maybe we can get FIFA. Honestly, anything works. I whoever say, what do we do? Yeah, but, we get yeah FIFA but this is the whole point is the fact that each and every one of these leaders respects somebody and is about bringing that person around the table. And I've never been precious about success and I've never been unable to work with somebody in order to get something. So this new leader, he probably wants an oil contract, he wants something else. Bring him back the FGM legislation will give him a better platform. And it's about saying those things to really get these leaders to understand that if they want to be taken seriously on the global stage, then you have to show that you're doing, um, what is it, making big boy moves, as the kids say. So he's going to be, so I think, yeah, that would be my thing. I have a question over here. Um, I'm Natasha and I'm the founder of Bold Voices. Um, I actually had a question for you about uh, that's kind of in the online space and about the Me Too movement. Um, obviously, the Me Too movement was founded by a woman of colour and there's been a lot of criticism that's been hijacked by kind of white Western feminists and women. Um, but I was wondering um, how you see the Me Too movement, um, how it's affected FGM and conversation around FGM. And if it hasn't, like, why not? Um, it was started um, by um, a black woman, but I think it was just like how the media portrays things. And, it's, and, if, and if you look a certain way and you do a certain thing, then the conversation is like, you know, it's amplified. Like FGM hasn't come into the Me Too movement in the, in, in the sense that I think the, the organised and the concept of it and, and the... Um, um, and, and HIV means that it's not the same thing, but it is part of the conversation about misogyny and, and how we raise men and how we have conversations. And I think that fits into the whole point of how do you have conversations about the fact that you think it's okay, like, you know, there, there are men having conversations about the female anatomy that kind of feed into stereotypes around FGM and feed into stereotypes about what the female anatomy looks like. And that's what the Me Too movement is about, is that I say, um, I say that I've got, like, you know, four incredible brothers and, I've got, and, I, I, and I had an amazing grandfather, but they were also probably had like you know had did something wrong to a woman so we have to understand that we collectively as women are the mothers and the wives and the people that are staying silent to these things and challenge our, our boys and I do, so I don't think like you know white white feminists being involved in the conversation around um, um, the Me Too movement has actually de um, um, derailed it and as long as we're always very much conscious about whose voice we're not hearing as well as part of that 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 is a good thing but there's nothing wrong with us talking about the fact that it's about challenging misogyny and is also understanding that misogyny is deadly to men as much as it is to women okay on that note i'm going to wrap up um the discussion um but before we go nimco what do we do what what's the kind of what what, what what is the kind of next step for us what's the big thing that we should be doing and um, the big thing is the fact that um um that diffid has committed 50 million to the next phase of ending fgm and with a, a with a preamble that this should go to women on the front line there is no way of us doing that at the moment so it's about let's keep challenging our leaders to say okay if we really want to end fgm let's invest in women in africa let's invest in women on the ground and make them comfortable about the fact that this is something that we're all like you know really keen on and also obviously fund data you, you can't do anything without data if i am um, i can believe fgm can end but we need the um actual um context to it nicola uh, invest in long-term programming forget the two three years it's not going to change um and invest in the long-term research but at the same time and that's what you were going to pick up on the point yesterday that Susanna Moorhead um the chair of the OEC DAC committee made yesterday that we're seeing only four percent of international aid invested in gender-related projects we need to a increase that but b also make sure that that marker is not just about gender projects but we're also looking at the investments at what stage in the life cycle so what percentage is also going to girls and to adolescent girls who are often the ones who are most vulnerable to these practices okay to the front line and to women right 
on that note, um, thank you all for joining us this morning, um, both those who are here in the room, those who are online. Um, the video and the audio of this event is going to be available on the website shortly. Uh, I've had a little request in um, from somebody online asking for uh, links towards evidence research and arguments um, uh, for uh, when you're facing somebody uh, pro-FGM, and I'm hoping uh, that ODI will be able to deliver those online as well for them. Um, so could, at this point, you thank me for uh, thank us uh, thank, join me in thanking Nimco for um, getting up on a Friday morning and for being the first <laughs> event of the day uh, for International Women's Day, and also to Nicola for bringing her expertise um, and research to the conversation. Thank you.